So this project sprung out of trying to understand how our BPF runtime implements the various operations and how it compares stacks up against Linux. Uh, so, so what's the slides here? I guess no. So problem statement we're trying to solve here. Pro BPF programs are very much becoming cross-platform. They are often used in performance-sensitive paths. And there's an expectation from our developers that the performance on the various platforms is at least similar. If not, if they don't, at least if they don't perform exactly the same, they perform at least in a similar fashion. Uh, one of the things we noticed while profiling some of the Cilium code as we ported to Windows is that the cost of the help functions is really what dominates the cost of BPF programs, much more than the actual BPF code itself. So the question we ended up asking is, you know, does this even matter? I mean, is the performance of the BPF runtime impactful? Uh, so sort of things we're looking at there is, how does it impact the cost of cycles per byte for network operations? Likewise, does it have an impact on latency and jitter? A uh, couple of other things that are kind of interesting we, we decided to measure is, if there's any overhead from transitioning from the kernel to the BPF virtual machine. Uh, in our case, it's a little bit different than Linux simply because of how we do RCUE. We essentially have something that's equivalent of a similar to uh, RCUE read lock around the entire EBPF program. Uh, likewise, we wanted to measure the performance of our help functions. And more than that, so the interesting question to us was, what is the best way to measure this? Uh, our, our goal there really was to make this both platform neutral in that we'd like to be able to run the same tests on any platform as well as to make them repeatable. We really wanted on results that could be run by other people and get the same results. So from this, we developed uh, the BPF performance suite. It is a MIT licensed project. It is essentially a collection of very small BPF programs that exercise specific aspects of BPF runtime, primarily helper functions. Uh, it then uses the libbpf library, which is becoming cross-platform, or at least reasonably cross-platform, uh, to be able to load it on both Windows and Linux. We then end up scheduling execution of the BPF program on a varying number of CPUs to execute concurrently. Uh, the reason you use this is that because BPF prog test run reports back uh, the mean time for invocation of a program. So the sort of the tests we ran here are this is the first of the baseline is essentially a EBF program that just really simply just shows zero. There's nothing more than that. Likewise, we have a set of generic map tests that are for help functions that come across multiple map types, like lookup, update, delete. Likewise, we also looked at some of our help functions, uh, the p random, get the k time, get nanoseconds, and tail call. In addition, there are some other special cases. For instance, the LPM map has some slightly different tests simply because LPMs are used slightly differently than traditional maps. Uh, for the LPM case, we specifically decided to take the BGP data as a set of route lengths to essentially allow us to more accurately emulate what we perceive as real use, real world usage of a LPM. Uh, and likewise for LRU, we have two types of tests. We have essentially random random lookups, updates, and deletes, as well as what we refer to as a rolling lookup and update. Where a rolling one is a small subset of the LRU map is in use, but which subset is in use slowly rolls forward through a set of keys. This gives us the behavior that a small set of our keys are actively in use, whereas unused keys slowly fall off the list uh, are no vector. For each of our tests, we essentially divide it into two, two steps. There is a preparation stage. This, is, this allows us to pre-populate maps and other kernel state that is necessary to then run the test. Uh, 
This is done from a BPF program because that is the simplest way to make it cross-platform and also makes it a lot simpler to execute. Uh, the prep phase is not measured itself. It's designed to run a single CPU and just, as I mentioned, populate all the maps. The execution then is scheduled on all CPUs and executed in parallel. Uh, within the eBPF for Windows project, we actually use it as part of our daily CI CD. This allows us to track any changes to performance, both positive and negative. Uh, we actually publish our data on a using via a Grafana website. It's accessible from our front page of eBPF for Windows, but I'll also provide the link here. We are in the process of getting the Windows versus Linux performance up and running. There is the, the main blocker here is while we have some data from running the tests on GitHub hosted runners, the challenge there really is that GitHub hosted runners don't give us the control of what Linux kernel version to run, as well as what distribution, and we don't have as much confidence in what the state of the machines is, because as I mentioned, we don't control them. In addition, we see a, a fair degree of variability in the runs when running on the self hosted runners. And lastly, uh, this is less relevant, but we do actually see some difference from Windows's AOT or ahead of time compilation versus Linux's JIT, JIT compilation. Oops, back slide. That's not what I wanted. Oops, nice there. Uh, one thing we did notice is just within our own testing, the ahead of time, in our case, significantly outperforms the JIP path. Uh, for what we see there is the AT path has a better job of discarding unneeded code. In the JIT case, our, at least our JIT compiler is pessimistic and emits code to do things like save registers because it doesn't have the knowledge what registers are needed, what ranges are not needed. We do notice that the C compiler, which may be a bad thing, does actually uh, optimize and alter the order of some of the JIT code. Uh, for anything on the Windows side, we also note a couple of things that where we are lacking, for instance, our per thread state, uh, we definitely need a feature we need from the Windows side that is lacking, and that costs us quite heavily. Uh, one thing we did notice is our LPM is implemented significantly differently from the Linux one. Uh, its lookup performance is fairly close to that of Linux, but our, up, our update performance significantly outperforms. From what we understand here, Linux uses a single global lock when performing updates to an LPM, whereas our hash table-based implementation has a lock per bucket, allowing us to essentially outperform on the update path. Probably not super relevant as LPMs don't tend to be write heavy, but it's just uh, interesting there. The other one there is we've had a really challenging time to match Linux's LRU performance. Kudos to the Linux uh, team that implemented that. Uh, we pretty much came to the conclusion that trying to manage the global consensus of key age is expensive, however you do it. Eventually, what we settled on is a partitioned generational LRU. Uh, it gives us the best performance that we've, we've managed to eke out. So for there, I'm just going to bring up the slides for, sorry, the, this is our public page with our BPF performance results. As I mentioned, we track a whole variety of different things. As I mentioned, a baseline is essentially the minimal cost for an empty eBPF program. It is simply just a return zero. The time here is in nanoseconds. Uh, so then this allows us to then, when we look at any of the other ones, for instance, the map array read, the time here is essentially the cost of the baseline invocation plus the cost of the map call. Uh, the interesting thing is that what's use, what, one of the reasons it's useful to us is that as I mentioned, we can track over time, and we can actually see here, this is a point where uh, when we update our LRU implementation to go from a global generational LRU to a partitioned LRU, and we actually noticed that we saw significant performance improvements there. 
Uh, likewise, areas that we are currently trailing fairly badly on are our tail core performance and as well as our map and map performance. We do have some comparison data for Linux versus Windows. It is very provisional simply because this code is running on uh, GitHub hosted runners. So we have minimal control over it. Likewise, we don't have any control over about the Linux kernel version. It's the version that shifts to 2204. So I mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, our tail, for, tail core performance significantly trails. This we build root cause to primarily a result of how we handle rundown of uh, the relationship between BPF programs and maps. Essentially, uh, prog maps and programs can form circular dependencies. And to break that, we have a weak reference model that is currently somewhat expensive. So that's one area we, did, we are trailing fairly badly. Uh, by comparison, for instance, uh, some of our other ones where we are doing better, our turns out our random number, our BPF get or PRANDOM U32, at least within the hardware testing on it, seems to significantly outperform the Linux one. Uh, this, from our side, was a something we intentionally had to do. It turned out the uh, pseudo random number generator that built, that's built into the Windows kernel is maintains a single global state. And when it's invoked from concurrent threads, it performs particularly badly. Uh, it essentially scales in diversity with the number of CPUs. So we ended up having to uh, re-implement a Mersenne twister to be able to achieve a reasonable uh, pseudo random number performance. As I mentioned before, we have a variety of LPM tests ranging from a uh, thousand entries to a million entries within our LPM. Again, this is where we run into issues of these VMs being particularly noisy, but we do see our performance, uh, the median performance of a run to run is close to that of Linux, despite being a significantly different implementation, a hash table based implementation instead of an LPM. Whereas our update was kind of one of the more interesting ones is the update path. We do actually significantly outperform Linux on the update path. Uh, from talking to people who've, because obviously, well, because of license constraints, I can't look at the Linux code myself, but I've been told that Linux has a single top level lock for the entire LPM. And whenever you have to most modify the LPM, the replace requires, requires acquiring the global lock. Uh, yeah, and as I mentioned before, yeah, our telco performance, very similar to our map and map performance. It suffers from the effect of, let me find an example of map and map. Uh, yeah, our map and map performance trails the Linux's map and map performance. Not as badly, but it's definitely a delta there. So, uh, at this point, I said, uh, very much intend to keep this relatively short because I realize it's approaching six o'clock there. I don't want to keep people longer than necessary. So at this point, I think I'll throw it up into any questions people have. There was this one spike in the map and map. Do you know what it was? Just curious that you showed like in the uh, last one. Yeah, this, unfortunately, as I, as I mentioned before, these are run from within GitHub hosted runners. Okay. And that's part of one of the things we're trying to fix. So the our our daily runs for our for our, for our official runs are run on dedicated VMs, uh, where we have see significantly less variability. Uh, but currently, we don't have we don't have dedicated Linux VMs set up for the a good side side by side comparison. It is something we're currently working through to resolve, but. Yeah, so beyond merely just the variability, the other challenge we face with the GitHub hosted runners is we don't really get a choice about what Linux kernel version to run. Because that was one of the other one of the other aspects which we think could be interesting is to look at how the various uh, map types, etc., perform version to version within the Linux kernel. So that's one of our sort of longer term goals. But yeah, the goal here is 
essentially as much as possible to run exactly the same code on Linux and Windows so we can get a reasonable comparison of performance there. Uh, another question. In one of the slides you mentioned that uh, optimizing JIT provides much better performance than just like Linux JIT. Yeah, uh, so can you give an example? Mm, so yeah, one of, the, one of the simplest examples there, actually, uh, bear with me a moment here. I can bring up the data from our recent runs. Uh, assume it ran last night. Yep, it did. Uh, to, to find the JIT one here. So in this case, this is the Windows JIT based on UBPF. Uh, so fun. This is the this is not JIT. This one. So so the simplest case of this is a results here. Yep, there we go. Uh, so approximately on this machine, 36 for the P random, we use about around 36 nanoseconds versus on the Windows one. Again, the, the delta was from quite a while back, so it may have shrunk. So 36 nanoseconds versus 24 for the JIT. So the JIT is, or at least let me rephrase that. The UBPF JIT is approximately 50% slower than running it through the optimizing compiler. When we examine the resulting code, we see that there are, there's significantly more code being injected, particularly for things like saving, one of the things that UBPF does, it saves all volatile, sorry, all non-volatile registers, uh, even if they're not used by that particular uh, program, simply because our JIT compiler isn't smart enough to figure out which ones are need to be saved, not don't need to be saved. But so. in this case, it's just a <clears throat> trivial UPF program that's calling a single helper, just get the random, that's it? Yep, yep. So, but the program is just like one, well, two instructions, call and return, right? Yep, essentially, yes. And what we see there is the overhead around, so in that, in the, in that, is, that example, the BPF program is only touching a, a small number of registers, of, sorry, of, uh, only touching a small number of non-volatile registers, but because our JIT compiler doesn't track what registers are accessed, it has to save all of the registers that could be used and restore them at the end. I see. So yeah, that, well, for trivial <clears throat> program of two instructions, like saving extra five registers and restoring can have an effect. But uh, like Linux, well, at least x86 uh, Linux JIT, it uh, saves only what's necessary. Can you do the same like benchmarking like Linux JIT versus Windows optimizing JIT? So yeah, so for the same test here, again, this is run on a, let's find the right one, this debug. This one, find the right one. Yep. So this is the Linux JIT. Similar hardware. Uh, so part of the problem, this is part of the challenge here is we don't have good control of the hardware. Based on GitHub's data, published data, this should be the same hardware, but I don't necessarily trust the numbers. Because I said, we don't have control of what's running on the hardware. But we see significantly higher times on Linux versus Windows here. The majority of that they will notice is that just for a simple single instruction BPF program that essentially is sets R0 to zero, sorry, yeah, sets R0 to zero and returns, the Linux JIT one reports a much higher time. So again, this may very well be either an artifact of how we're testing or an artifact of the machines we're running on. Hence the need to set up a dedicated environment here. So. I see. Yeah, but <clears throat> it would be interesting to drill into this like data and see how much we're actually like leaving on the table in terms of performance. So there are like certain areas that we know about where we should still improve. Uh, yeah. Not not going to like full optimizing JIT, but like certain cases definitely like makes sense. Like number of registers that exist and. Yeah, definitely. So I said, for example, here, here's the, the baseline one. It's pretty much just return zero, which becomes the two BPF instructions. And likewise, for the helpers, the P random one is, yep, pretty much just 
grab the p random value in return. Yeah, so. it looks like <clears> the <throat> only difference is function prolog epilog. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Any other last questions, comments? Yeah. If not, then that's it for today. Thank and you very much for your time. Thank you very much.